Welcome to chapter 17. Yes, well, are you are you uh, uh, decompressed from chapter 6, chapters 5 and 6? Keep studying them, keep studying them, because we're going to ask you again all the questions about chapter 5. We're going to go through the uh, chapter 6 models, the constant perpetual growth model, and the and the discounted cash flow model. And now we're going to add to that ratio analysis, which is nowhere near as exciting as dividend discount models. I know, I know. Uh, <laughs> excitement is not the word you were thinking of, was it? If for me, it is. But it's very important. In fact, Mr. Benjamin Graham, none other than uh, Mr. Warren Buffett's teacher, was a big fan of ratio analysis. And when you read, eventually, not the first book, but when you read The Intelligent Investor, you will see how he uh, weaves together a story based on the financial ratios. And as we're going to discuss over and over again, there's no one financial ratio that we use to uh, say, oh, yes, this is it. This is the company I'm going to buy or I'm going to sell this company. No, we have to think of it like a stew, like a, uh, an, a, a an, an entire mosaic of information. OK, now in the book, those of you are following in the book, they Based, they mostly uh, discuss projecting cash flow and earnings, but we've already done that a little bit, and um, and we're going to basically look at the ratio analysis that's in Chapter 17. And so we'll skip the forecasting bit because we've already done a little bit of that. Slide number two. The three financial statements that a publicly traded company must supply every quarter are the balance sheet, income statement, and cash flow statement. Now, <clears throat> relax, you accounting students. We're not going to do any journal entries, no trial balances. <laughs> we simply pick up the balance sheets, the income statements, and the cash flow statements that are given to us. Uh, yeah, so don't go screaming into the night thinking you're going to have to do accounting again. Okay? And we'll look at each one of these in detail. The balance sheet being the snapshot of the firm's assets and liabilities. The income statement being the summary summary of the operating results, right? The, the movie, the cash going in, the cash going out. And then the cash flow statement. Wait a minute, Payana. Well, how's that different from the income statement? Well, we're going to see that the income statement has some entries in it which really are not cash related they they aren't uh they aren't really entries that we write a check for but they allow us to reduce our income and hence pay fewer dollars in taxes and that's why we have the cash flow statement to at more accurately get an idea of what's going on with the company's checkbook how much cash is really coming into the company how much cash is really going out so let's take a look in detail at the balance sheet and it's actually a very simple um, a document. Uh, why do they call it a balance sheet? Well, they used to have them side by side. They used to have the assets on one side and the liabilities on the equity on the other side. And the two must balance. Well, they don't do that anymore, but that's, they still have the name, the balance sheet. In those of you who have taken Business 121, Financial Planning and Money Management, this is what we call our net worth statement. All right, assets minus liabilities minus debts equals we call it net worth, but the accountants call it equity. It means the same thing. And what they do is they, um, the accountants, they lump everything into either current assets, meaning you use them up within a year, and long term, anything more than a year. Now, we in the finance world, we have short term, intermediate term, and long term, so they don't actually jive one and with one another very well. But we're going to take a look at Ford. And... I didn't get these from Ford's uh, uh, website, from their annual report. I guess I should have, because I have a tendency not to put too much credence into Yahoo's uh, statements, but this is that's where I got them from. So let's take a look at the balance sheet for Ford. So here we go, and we're looking at the yearly data. So here we are at the end of 2017. And we start off with the assets. 
the assets. And notice we can go back in time and see how the, uh, the Ford's balance sheet has changed through time. So we start off with the current ass the assets. And again, the, the accountants lump them into current assets and then anything long term. So as of December 31st, 2017, Ford was sitting on over $18 billion of cash <laughs> and 20 billions of short term investments. People owed them 60, almost 63 billion and their inventory was about 10 billion and about 4 billion other ass, uh, current assets. So they were sitting on 116 some billion dollars. I know it looks like millions, but you got to add three zeros at the end. And then they have some long-term investments in property, plant, and equipment. And, and their total assets were almost $258 billion. Okay, great. How much do they owe? Well, now we go down and we see that they owed, in terms of current liabilities, almost well $94.5 billion. So they owe people over $23 billion. They have some short-term debt coming due. Fifty-one and a half billion, and then other liabilities, almost twenty billion, and then one hundred and two billion, one hundred three billion dollars in long-term debt. So their total liabilities were two hundred twenty-three billion almost. So what's left over? After we subtract the assets minus liability, there's about thirty-five billion dollars left over in equity. So think about it. This is what we did in 121, but we did it on a personal level. If you were to, if you were to uh, uh, wipe off all the assets, you know, sell all the assets and pay off all the debts on the books, which not, doesn't how it really works in real life, but it, according to the accountants, there'd be about 35 billion dollars left over. Does that make sense? Okay, and so. Just by looking at that, we can see that you know Ford's in pretty darn good shape. And then we're going to learn about the ratios as we go uh, along the way. And we're going to pick out numbers from the balance sheet and from the other financial statements. Okay, so let's take a look at now the next uh, uh, financial statement. And that's the income statement. That's very simple, folks. You take the company's revenues and subtract their expenses. And that's their income. <laughs> Net income equals revenue minus expenses. And you have that money left over to pay dividends to the shareholders or, or use it to finance the future growth of the company. And so let's take a look at the income statement for Ford and see that Ford is actually doing pretty darn good, folks. Let's go back up to the top. Here's the top line number. Do you remember listening to the earnings calls? And they talk about the top line growth and the bottom line growth. Here's the revenue. Almost $157 billion they sold in, in, uh, in cars in 2017. Again, we're looking at the yearly data. You can then uh, get more precise by looking at the quarterly data. But we're looking at their yearly data. And in 2017, it cost them... Cost of goods sold, cost of revenue, $140 billion. So their gross profit was $16.34 billion. But then there's that S, J, G, and A, or S, G, and O. I know that yeah, some of you had a hard time finding it, and I don't blame you because I first thought, wait, are they talking about sales general and other expenses, or sales general and operating uh, administrative expenses? Yes, that's exactly what they're talking about. So then we get from our gross profit, we take away the sometimes called overhead, overhead, because you got to pay that no matter what. And their operating income, and notice if it's a loss, you put it in parentheses, is $4.8 billion. Not bad, Ford, huh? So now they had some other income coming in, and the numbers don't jive. So I'm not exactly sure. I don't know if I trust Yahoo that much. But uh, let's say their income from continuing operations after we paid off the interest and the taxes and all the other things we have to pay is $8.8 .8 million, And then all of a sudden it turns to $7.6 I'm sorry, $8.8 .8 and $7.6 That number I'm 
kind of believe <laughs> because that's the number that that uh, when you look at the other websites it, it reports that too so you got to wonder what's going on with these with these um statements in, in my humble opinion which is why I always trust the um the annual report go to go to the get the annual report and see how that uh at, that um that it jives with what these websites are reporting. But these websites are supposed to get their data from the EDGAR. We'll, we'll look at EDGAR in a few slides, which is, I'm not sure what it stands for, but it's the Securities and Exchange Commission's database of financial statements for companies that they are legally required to, uh, to um, um, submit every quarter. Okay, so it says there's the bottom line, right? After you've paid off all the workers and the cost of goods sold and the administration expenses and the taxes and all that other stuff, the interest, you wind up with $7.6 billion. So Ford had a pretty darn good year, 2017. But let's go back to the slide and see that some income and expenses are not always received or paid for in cash. <laughs> that's why there's the statement of cash flows or the cash flow statement. Now, if you'll, if you'll uh, bear with me, the cash flow statement actually tells us what's going on with the checkbook. If you remember Business 121, Financial Planning and Money Management, those of you who have taken it, the income statement was our cash flow statement in the, in the 121 class. And the accountants cringe when we use the term cash flow statement for, for what is our, really our income statement. But, our, but we don't have all this fancy depreciation and all these other operating and investment cash flows and financing cash flows. So, so we just use the term cash flow statement. All right, accountants, give us a little slack. But in the world of publicly traded companies, this is very important. Why? Because this tells you what's going on with the checkbook. <laughs> so let's take a look at the cash flow statement, sometimes called the statement of cash flows, which I think is a little more fancier. And notice it starts where the income statement ended. Okay, Ford, you said you earned $7.6 billion. What happened to your checkbook? Well, the very first thing they do is they add back the depreciation. Because the depreciation is something that allows us to reduce our income so we pay fewer dollars in taxes, but we never wrote a check to depreciation. That money did not come out of our bank. It didn't come out of our checkbook. So we add it back in. And then there are all these different um, uh, entries that adjust our, our cash flow from capital expenditures to investments to dividends that we've paid from purchasing or selling stock and other investment activities. And finally, we find that the bottom line for Ford is after everything is said and done, that they paid all that dividends, because they, they, they pay very nice dividends, folks, by the way, Ford does, these days anyway, uh, their checkbook went up by $2.5 billion. That's what the statement of cash flows tells us. And why is that important? Well, as we said in the previous chapter, and I think in chapter five also, that sometimes companies will have huge sales and huge income, but their checkbook is going down. Huh? That doesn't make any sense. Right. This, there are accounting entries that allow them to book the sales as if money was coming in, but in really reality, the money didn't come in. Remember Lucent Technologies? They sold all this wonderful uh, cell, cell phone, uh, mobile phone, telephone equipment, but the companies didn't have any cash. They were just starting up, so they said, "Don't worry, Lucent, we'll pay you the two billion dollars over the next twenty years." And then the company promptly went out of business, and Lucent had to write off—that's the term we use—write off. They had basically had to fess up and say, "You know what? We're never going to get any of this money." <laughs> so, good quality versus poor quality earnings. So, does that make sense? And this is where the accountants really do have a little bit of a leg up on the rest of us. I took accounting a million years ago, and I actually did pretty well. And after I got out of both of those classes, I said, I'm never doing that again. <laughs> so uh, I, not, to, not, trying to, you know, not trying to be nasty or anything, but I just thought, 
I if I'm ever going to do this for a living, they better pay me a whole lot of money because I can't imagine doing this every day. I would go out of my mind. Not that I didn't do okay. I did. I did okay, and I thought, oh, this is interesting. Uh, but um, but so the accountants really do have a leg up, so to speak, on the rest of us. And the more you learn about accounting, the more uh, familiar and at ease you will be with these financial statements, which are very important, folks. Okay? Slide number six. Where do we get the data from? Well, as I said, I mentioned, there's a system called EDGAR where the companies are required to post their financial data every year in the annual report, the 10K, and every quarter in the quarterly update, the 10Q. 10Q! <laughs> You're welcome. I use that joke in class and the students groan. Um, 10Q, you're welcome. Anyway, anyway, um, it used to be that companies could speak to the folks on Wall Street, the uh, analysts and other, you know, very important investors, and tell them about what's going on before this data was be was made available. Well, in the late 1990s, the Securities and Exchange Commission said, look, you can't do this anymore, folks. And given that we now have the technology to inject this data into a worldwide system that anybody can uh, get at at the same time, we now have Regulation FD, Fair Disclosure, which requires companies to make those disclosures fairly. And now what that means is they do an earnings call. And that's what you did in Chapter 5, right? You Maybe you listened to the earnings call as it was happening, but mostly what you probably did is just go listen to it if they still have it available or read the, uh, the transcript uh, a month or weeks or whatever afterwards. And so that nobody can get a leg up on somebody else and say, oh, you know what, they're going to miss, they're, they're going to really have a bad quarter this quarter and, and be able to sell or buy before everybody else. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. I think so. And then there are countless other sources of information. I have heard people complain that there's just too much information. And I agree. It's almost like a sip from the fire hose. And I love this guy, Nick Murray. He wrote a few books, mostly geared towards um, financial professionals. Uh, and you might read his stuff, but, but he has a great saying, wisdom sold separately. Isn't that great? In other words, sure, there's plenty of data out there, plenty of information. But to make sense of it, that's you're going to have to <laughs> you're going to have to pay me if you want me to make sense of it for you. I'm having enough time making sense of it for myself. <laughs> Slide number seven. Now, let's regroup and, and, and um, review these financial ratios. A financial ratio is a very simple statistic, folks. You just take two financial quantities and you divide them. <laughs> you divide one by the other. That's the quotient. And we're going to do some ratio analysis. That's the study of the relationships between financial statement accounts. And as we've said over and over again, please recall that there is no one ratio that can accurately sum up the overall general state of a company. Each ratio must be considered in the context of all the information gathered. Plus, you must consider any ratio in the context of the industry that the company exists within. In other words, you got you can't just look at the one company. You got to look at their competitors and the industry as a whole and the market as a whole. And we're going to see an example in just a few slides. Slide eight: the common stock ratios, sometimes called the market ratios or the market prospect ratios, and these are all review. So we're going to burn through these fairly quickly after looking at a serious example because we've already gone through price to earnings. Uh, dividends per share, dividend yield, the dividend payout ratio, book value per share, and price to book, price to cash flow, price to sale. They all work the same as price to earnings. The only new one that we're going to take a look at is the PEG ratio, the price to earnings to growth ratio. Slide number nine, price to earnings. Folks, this is the most popular stock market statistic. 
This is the one number that people jump and look at before any others. Because it tells you how much you're willing to pay for a dollar's worth of earnings, right? <laughs> we take the market price of the common stock and divide it by the earnings per share. And as we saw in Chapter 5, it's a very simple calculation. But we don't even do it. We just go online and it yells at us, right? It's up there. It's one of the first things we see when we look at the summary page of any stock. And to review, this is the most popular stock market statistic. Historically, P.E. ratios were in the 5 to 12 range for mature companies, 14 to 20 for growing companies, and greater than 20 was unusual, but today it is commonplace. And I make this mention, and some people get a little upset with me. They say, well, why is that important? And you decide whether it's important or not. But the P.E. ratio also tells you how long it will take in years, assuming no changes in earnings, for the company to earn back its price. Huh? Well, if you, if you have a P.E. of three, in three years they will earn back their, their price in earnings. If it's a P.E. of 20, it'll take 20 years. If it's a P.E. in the hundreds, it's going to take hundreds of years. Now, remember, everything's changing. The price and the earnings are changing all the time, and the investors' expectations of the future are changing all the time. So whether or not this is an important statistic or an important idea for you to think about, is it's up to you. Mr. Peter Lynch mentioned it a few times, and I just thought it was kind of interesting. Uh, if you don't, if it, if it speaks to you, if it makes any sense to you, great. And if not, just forget about it. It's not that important. Make sure you understand that the higher the PE, the more investors are expecting the future to be great for this company. And maybe it will be, maybe it won't be. The lower the PE, the fewer, the, the, the fewer expectations investors have. They're not as excited about the future of the company. Slide 10. So now let's take a look at six different companies in wildly different industries. Exxon, Facebook, Amgen, it's a biotech company. U.S. Bank, General Mills, Cheerios, and Pfizer, that's a drug company. And you look at the PEs and you think, well, this is strange. Look at that. Uh, Exxon 17, which is, you know, about average. Facebook's 25. People are pretty excited about that. Look at Amgen, 62. People are really excited about Amgen. U.S. Bank, a little, little under 14. And General Mills, 12. And Pfizer, 12. So, obviously, people aren't too excited about about Cheerios or, or Viagra. <laughs> uh, Lipitor is their big drug. Uh, well, but the problem is we have to look at companies that are in the same industry. You have to look at their cohorts. So let's take a look at some cohorts here. And in the energy world, we see that, oh, yeah, BP and Conoco are a little higher. Chevron's a little higher than Exxon. Shell's a little lower. But in general, they're all about the same, but not so in the tech world. Huh? Look at Facebook, 25, which is high, but Google's 52, Twitter's 92, and Amazon and Netflix are priced to perfection at 158, 159, 169, 170. What's going on? Well, when you see something like this, and Twitter at 92, I should have put an exclamation point there, and even Google, you, you, it's, a, it's a red flag. It's saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, you need to do more research. Something's funny here. Is, does, do these companies really deserve these PEs? And if you talk to folks who are you know, big fans of tech, They'll say, yeah, oh yeah, they're taking over the world. They are disrupting the industries. They are distru disrupting, excuse me, disrupting the, uh, the, the, the culture and, and, the, uh, and, the, and, the, and the world. So yeah, sure. But you know what, folks? <laughs> if something goes wrong, those parachutes had better be very, very large because uh, there's a long way to fall, right? Now, let's take a look at the biotech world. Oh, my goodness, it's all over the map. Yes, you really, I mean, when you, when you start looking at biotech companies, you know one or two of these companies is going to just hit it big. But the rest of them, oh, well. 
Now, obviously, people are excited about Amgen and Illumina, but, eh, I mean, they're still excited about Biogen and Celgene, but not as much as the other two. And this is where there's tr tremendous potential for, 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 for striking it rich and for losing everything. Uh, one of my favorite companies was bought a couple of years ago, no, a year ago, by Amgen, Kite Pharmaceuticals. And they're not the only ones. There's Bluebird... And then Juno, I think, was bought also. These are companies that are working on curing cancer. Very cool. It's going to happen. Now, how? When? You know, how, is it going to happen five years, ten years? I don't know. Let's hope for sooner for the people who have cancer. But this is so cool. And that was Kite Pharmaceuticals' uh, 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 motto. We are going to cure cancer. Something along those lines. I'm not sure. I don't remember exactly what it was. So you really, that means you really have to do your research and realize that you could do very, very well and you could lose everything. Yeah, many years ago, I was a sucker for biotech. And, uh, you know, they, they all started off really well. Yeah. What about the banks? You know, before deregulation and before the uh, the housing crisis and the bubble and the housing bubble and then the, uh, the the debt crisis, banks used to be boring, stodgy, you tight like utilities, paid a, set, a hefty, a very delicious dividend, healthy dividend. And then things got out of whack, and the banks, banks became exciting, and that was a bad sign. And, of course, it ended badly, and it could still end badly because they're still trying to pull off the uh, things that they shouldn't be doing, in my humble opinion. But they've become more and more boring again. Look, everyone is under that, except for J.P. Morgan. Everyone's under 15. J.P. Morgan's at 15, which is, you know, pretty low by today's standards. So do you want something boring that pays dividends and ain't going to go away? Because the regulators and the government won't let them go away. <laughs> go buy a bank. Now, food companies. Hmm. Well, again, food companies, not too exciting. Look at Kraft Heinz. People are really not excited about Kraft, are they? And so that, we give a question mark. Now, wait a minute. Does it really deserve a P.E.? much less than their cohorts, than their, I don't know, that's something that we use as a little red flag. I use that, that analogy there uh, to go do more research. And Hormel is higher than General Mills and Kellogg's, right? Boring companies, everybody eats their Cheerios and their cornflakes. Do people eat more cornflakes because the economy is growing? No. Do they eat less? No. They need You need food. But for some reason, Hormel commands a, a little higher. Uh, so let's do some research and see if spam really is a, you know, so if I were Hormel, if I were the company, I would start an email campaign and I would call it, this is spam mail. <laughs> you know, I think they'd. They, they're very sensitive about that. And I, I don't know if you, you younger folks know, but the, the term spam originally came from, I'm assuming, I mean, I, we should really do this more research, but it was something that you didn't want because there's a, a old Monty Python skit about spam and the, the, all, they go to this restaurant and the woman, everything is spam and the woman says, but I don't like spam. And she, she says, well, everything we have is spam. So you've got to have it. And now the drug company. What? Whoa! What the, what's going on here? Look at Pfizer. Twelve. Not very exciting, but Merck, Bristol Myers. Oh my goodness! Now, if we're going to even consider investing in these companies, we've got to do a whole lot more research and figure out what is going on. Well, you know, maybe it's just an anomaly. There's some data that has not made it into the PE yet. Maybe that their earnings have jumped dramatically, and it just hasn't been uh, put into the. 12, trailing 12 months PE, which is normally what is reported. So, and so investors have reacted and said, yeah, well, we know that. We know that the, the, P, the trailing PE is 275, but going forward, Bristol Myers has hit the ball out the park or whatever, whatever sports analogy you want to use. And now they deserve a much higher PE because next quarter, next year, it'll drop because their earnings have grown substantially. And what does NA mean? Not applicable. Well, when you see NA in a PE um, slot, that means that they're losing money. 
Right. Eli Lilly is actually not generating any earnings. They're losing money. So some some websites will report it as a negative number because that's what happens. The price divided by negative earnings gives you a negative number. So normally it's just not uh, it's not um, reported. But some websites will report the negative uh, PE. So you see what you're up against. This, according to the marketplace is what investors believe the futures are for these companies. Now, are they right? Well, we'll know in two to three to five years, but by then the world will have changed quite a bit. And that's what you're up against, dear students. And this is true for all of these ratios that we're going to go through in this chapter. It's just a, uh, a, a, uh, an, indica an indicator of more research we have to do. And then we have to look at all of them in 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 conjunction with one another. We can't just look at just one and say, ooh, 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 this is the I've already said this. This is the reason we're gonna buy this stock or sell this stock. We I I like to think of it like a soup, okay? And when you eventually read the uh, as I said, read the uh, the uh, intelligent investor. Don't read it first but what you'll see that Mr. Benjamin Graham uses these uh, ratios quite a bit, and you'll see how he uses them. Okay, slide number 11. How can we account for the wide price-to-earnings disparity between different industries and different companies within industries? Again, it is the expectation of future earnings and and possibly dividend growth by investors for companies that are paying dividend. It's all about the future. And this, you probably can't read it if you're looking at, looking at this on a smaller screen, but it's a quote by Jack Dreyfus from a random walk down Wall Street, and I'm going to read it now. Take a nice little company that has been making shoelaces for 40 years and sells at a respectable six times earnings ratio. This is 1960s, folks, 1950s. Change the name from Shoelaces Incorporated to Electronics and Silicon Firth Burners. In today's market, the words Electronics and Silicon are worth 15 times earnings. However, the real play comes from the word Firth Burners, which uh, no one understands. A word that no one understands entitles you to double your entire score. Therefore, we have six times earnings for the shoelace business, 15 times earnings for electronics and silicon, or a total of 21 times earnings. Multiply this by two for Firth Burners, and we now have a score of 42 times earnings for the new company. Uh, Mr. Jack Dreyfus was a very famous investor who started Dreyfus Funds. And uh, the technologies have changed, right? Because today you would replace Firth burners with cryptocurrencies or nanotechnology or 3D printing. And you would replace electronics and silicon with social networking and China or maybe marijuana. Exactly. <laughs> there is a whole lot of silliness that goes on in our industry, folks. Wait till we get to chapter seven and eight. Slide number 12, the peg ratio. Now, this is the one that we haven't looked at yet, so let's take a look at this. The peg ratio is simply a way to compare the P-E ratio to the rate of the growth. Huh? Well, as we said before, in the, in, in, traditionally, a company's growth rate should match its P-E. So if you take the P-E ratio and divide it by its three- or five-year growth rate, if it's equal to 1, that means it does. The P-E ratio equals the growth rate. So it's, a, it's a ratio. If it's higher than 1, that means the P-E ratio is, is bigger, is greater than the growth rate. And of course, if it's lower than 1, the P-E ratio is less than the growth rate. And greater than 1.0 is now commonplace, right? Because investors are just so much more aggressive in their in in their investing these days so is that a good sign is that a bad sign it's just one more piece of information it's just a way to, to compare the pe ratio with its growth rate if the peg ratio is one they match if it's greater than one the pe ratio is greater than the growth rate if it's less than one the pe ratio is less than the growth rate so you don't hear too much about this one but it's something to think about something to note Slide 13, 
dividends per share. This is review. You take the dividends and you divide it by the number of shares outstanding. As we discussed, dividends became taboo during the 1990s and since the 2000 to 2002 bear market, many investors have changed their minds about dividends. And it didn't help. In, it didn't help us in 2008, but uh, but but dividends can be discussed in polite company again. In my humble opinion, dividend yield a yet another important statistic that tells us how much it is paying us on a percentage basis, uh, percentage of the stock price. You take the dividends per share and divide it by the market price. You've done this already, right? This important statistic allows an investor to compare a company to other forms of investments that pay income, such as savings accounts or bonds. Traditionally, 4 to 6% was considered good. Currently, the S&P 500 is yielding just under 2%. 10-year treasury bonds yielding under 3%. Many savings accounts are still yielding far less than 1%. And some stocks are paying much more. Look at Ford. Yeah, look at, at uh, GM, the, the car companies. Not, not so much uh, Toyota. They're paying, what, about 25 or so. But, but take a look at, a, take a look at a, a Ford and GM. They're paying a very healthy dividend. Right. So some companies are paying more. AT&T and Verizon. Uh, the telecommunication companies. They're out there, folks. The yield hogs, as I like to call them. <laughs> Slide number 15. The dividend payout ratio. Again, review. My apologies if I'm burning through this too quickly. Just slow it down. This is a measure of how much a company's earnings are being paid out to the shareholders in the form of dividends. We calculated it back in Chapter 5. You take the dividends per share and you divide them by the earnings per share. A more mature company will often pay out almost all of their earnings or, or much of their earnings in the form of dividends. Why? Because they don't need the cash. Utility companies, how much cash do they need? They're not growing that. Fast. Some of them are in some growth areas, but for the most part, no. Uh, growing companies, of course, retain their earnings. You accounting fans know what that's called, right? Retained earnings. Money they haven't, income they have not paid out in the form of dividends. Why? Because they need to support the growth of the company. Cool. Slide number 16, book value per share. Again, uh, a, book, a value that we looked at back in Chapter 5. You take the common stockholder's equity and you divide that by the number of shares outstanding. And that tells an investor how much assets are behind each share of stock. In other words, as we said when we looked at the balance sheet, if all the assets of the company were liquidated and then the, uh, the, the uh, debts paid off, how much would each shareholder receive? It is common for the actual market price of a share to be above the book value per share since it just makes sense. The company is worth more intact than if it were dissolved. Today, it is very common for the market price to be far above the book value. And again, it just makes sense because think of a pizza shop or a shoe shop. If you were to sell off all the assets, pay off the debts, you really wouldn't have much left. It's the fact that the company's in business earning money that gives it its worth. Slide number 17. And then we take the price and we relate it to the book value. Price to book value. Take the market price and divide it by the book value. And we find that these numbers are 3, 4, 5, or higher. Given that the book value per share is often less than the market value price, the price to book value per share tells an investor how far above the book value the market value is. If they are equal to 1, obviously they're the same. But we see 3, 4, 5. If it's below one, that's a very dangerous situation, which we've discussed already. If the market price falls below the book value, assuming there is real value there, assuming that it's not just on the books, it's an accounting uh, uh, fantasy, accounting uh, uh, number, then there's real danger of that company being raided for its assets and sold off all the uh, selling off all the assets and paying the debts and walking away putting the company out of business. And we discussed this. It sounds horrible, 
uh, especially if you're an employee of that company who's been working there for 22 years. But no, that's what capitalism is all about. It's about the efficient use of that capital, which is a fancy word for resources. And so that company was probably on its way out anyway, and so it's the time to plow it under, like a, a farmer would plow the field and release that capital. And not only the, the money and the other resources, but we're talking about the humans. They're in, a, in an endeavor that is not productive, or at least that's what the market believes. So you decide whether or not you think that's a harsh way of dealing with people, or it's a smart way. Because that's why we have, as we discussed, that's why we have unemployment insurance. It's not to pay people not to work, folks. It's so that we can unleash, unleash their human re resources, unleash the human capital. Ah, that sounds like an ad. I apologize. Slide number 18, price to cash flow. Again, review. We take the price, and instead of dividing it by the earnings, we divide it by the cash flow. Because, as we said, Cash flow and earnings often differ for very reason, for varied reasons. The most common reason is the depreciation. And we talked about the good quality versus poor quality earnings during the Internet mania. Many companies were reporting record earnings. At the same time, their cash flow was negative. How could that be? Well, because of accounting irregularities or, uh, or gimmicks or... I don't know if I should use those words. The accountants might not appreciate that. But, yeah, sometimes it does seem a little <clears throat> like hanky-panky, doesn't it? And, of course, that's what happened with Enron. And some of you young folks don't remember Enron, but look them up. E-R-N-R-O-N, -R -R Enron, which used to be Houston Power and Gas, right? It became a, an exciting company. A utility company became an exciting company, a very dangerous combination. And then the, the accounting firm that did their accounting, Arthur Anderson, disappeared because they had done such gimmick, war, they had done such, you know, what's the word? Hanky-panky. <laughs> they had done such, uh, such uh, outrageous uh, accounting maneuvers to make it look like Enron was a whole lot better than it was when it was actually drowning. Uh, and so that company disappeared. <clears throat> look it up. Look it up. Look up Enron. Cool. Okay. Slide number 19, the common stock ratios. The last one is the price to sales ratio. And again, this is review. During the internet mania, many analysts use price to sales instead of price to earnings since most all the new companies never generated any earnings. Cool? Okay, so these are all review except for the peg ratio. Now, in our next presentation, we're going to look at new ratios, and we're going to do some calculations. So I want you to print out, or at least have available, uh, if you have a large screen, the Ford balance sheet and the Ford income statement, because we're going to pick out some numbers and do some, some calculations, and then do some comparisons. Okay, so we'll see you in our next presentation for Chapter 17. Study hard, dear students. Bring honor and glory to Southwestern College. We are so proud of you. We want you to be awesome.